All right, welcome to um, our first of three lectures on anxiety disorders. This is lecture four. And um, today we're gonna to be talking about just an overall introduction to disorders characterized by anxiety and fear. And then we're gonna focus on our first actual disorder of the semester, um, specific phobias. All right, so here we go. Introduction to anxiety and fear. So we've talked about this a little bit in previous lectures, but um, anxiety and fear are mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. So this is the branch of the autonomic nervous system that helps to control functions that enable survival under dangerous conditions. So fear is a visceral physiological response to immediate danger. It's fear is what we actually are experiencing when we experience the fight or flight reaction. Anxiety is a more future oriented state. Um, it can be characterized by cognitions like worry, apprehension, or dread. And it can also have physiological signs like um, tension, restlessness, irritability, difficulty sleeping, um, difficulty concentrating. All of that is due to heightened physiological arousal. So both anxiety and fear are characterized by sympathetic nervous system arousal. The difference is that fear is complete, immediate sympathetic nervous system arousal. So it's when your sympathetic nervous system completely takes over and you are ready to defend your life in the moment. Anxiety is sort of low level, constant physiological arousal. It tends to last a lot longer. Um, and when you're anxious, what's going on in your body is that you're primed to escape. So your body is ready to turn on the fight or flight reaction a lot faster than it would be under normal conditions, but you're not in full flight or fight or flight mode yet. So anxiety and fear are, I think, a, a great emotional system to start talking about um, disorders with because it's very clear and intuitive where they come from. It's pretty obvious that fear and anxiety are really adaptive emotions, both in modern life, but also in our hunter-gatherer ancestral environment. They both are helpful in dangerous situations um, and they definitely helped our ancestors survive. So all of us are descended from early hominids who successfully escape danger long enough to reproduce and to escape danger successfully in a hunter-gatherer environment, you need to have a strong fear reaction when your life is immediately threatened. And you also need to have um, a, the capability to experience anxiety. So you need to know when to be ready to turn on the fl flight or fight response at a moment's notice when you're in an unsafe situation. So the important thing to remember about where fear and anxiety come from is that all of us are descended from people who survived immediate danger and who lived in dangerous environments. And those emotions help people survive in those situations. However, um, anxiety disorders are um, aberrant. So they are quote unquote deviant. Um, and they come from an adaptive emotional system, anxiety and fear that is behaving in ways that aren't adaptive for the individual's current environment. And we know of many biological and psychological, as well as environmental risk factors for developing anxiety and fear. We're not gonna talk a lot about um, individual differences in neurotransmitter systems specifically, but the neurotransmitters that are definitely most implicated in fear and anxiety are excessive um, corticotropin releasing factor. So that's the hormone in your brain that starts the whole fight or flight cascade that ends in cortisol in your blood. Um, noradrenaline, which is implicated in panic disorders, um, and then not enough production of or signaling of GABA and serotonin. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about three body systems, which include neurotransmitters, but also include um, organs and brain regions that are involved in heightened vulnerability to anxiety. We're going to briefly touch on general cognitive influences on anxiety, but also other psychological disorders and then on some environmental influences that um, can interact with existing biological vulnerabilities or that can create biological vulnerability to anxiety. So the first body system we're gonna talk about is the HPA axis. And HPA, again, stands for the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal cortex. Those are the three bodily regions that are involved in this cascade that we experience when we're stressed. So the HPA axis's main function is to mediate the acute stress response. When your brain registers stress in the environment, uh, the HPA cascade starts and the end result is the release of cortisol into the blood, which causes activation of the sympathetic nervous system. 
So what these arrows pointing back from cortisol indicate is that there's also negative feedback built into the HPA axis. So when there's, when your um, adrenal cortex releases cortisol into your bloodstream, that cortisol circulates throughout your whole body. And eventually it makes its way back to the anterior pituitary at the base of your brain, and then eventually back to the hypothalamus inside your brain. And when cortisol binds to, the, to neurons in those structures, it causes them to stop firing. So basically this is a system that gives feedback to your brain saying, okay, you did your job, you turned on the fight or flight response. So there's cortisol in the blood now, you can stop firing CRH and ACTH and stop telling the adrenal cortex to produce more cortisol. So um, to be born with a vulnerability to anxiety from the HPA axis, you might have a stronger initial response. So your hypothalamus might produce more CRH or your pituitary might produce more um, ACTH or your adrenal cortex might produce more cortisol or all of the above. Alternately, or in addition, you could have weaker negative feedback. So you could just have um, genetic predisposition to cortisol having a weaker inhibitory effect on neurons in either the hypothalamus or the anterior pituitary. In a couple of lectures from now, um, we'll talk about the acute stress theory, or sorry, the chronic stress theory of depression development and how chronic constant cortisol signaling can actually weaken this negative feedback relationship in anyone's body. But to be born with a biological vulnerability to anxiety would mean um, just sort of coming out of the womb with stronger HPA axis activity or weaker HPA axis negative feedback. Another um, brain system that is implicated in the development of anxiety disorders from birth is the behavioral inhibition system. So the behavioral inhibition system comes from reinforcement sensitivity theory, which is essentially that there are two separate and somewhat competing brain systems, behavioral inhibition and behavioral activation. And like the name suggests, their um, competing functions are to produce avoidant, inhibited, safe behavior and to produce reward-seeking, active, outgoing behavior. These systems also are thought to mediate our um, ability to form negative conditioned associations. So the behavioral inhibition system is in charge of that and um, positive conditioned associations and to develop reward um, reinforced, or, sorry, for, <laughs> to mediate re reward reinforced operant conditioning. So the behavioral inhibition system is based in the limbic system. So the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that fears, feels fear, that produces the feeling of fear, and the hippocampus, which is um, implicated in learning. So the behavioral inhibition system has many functions, including our sort of natural, unlearned inhibitory behavioral responses to novel situations. Neophobia or avoidance of novelty is a natural human response, but we have individual differences in how neophobic we are as people. The behavioral inhibition system also helps us learn punishment signals in the environment. So it helps us form conditioned associations about punishment, about negative condition stimuli. It helps us learn when behaviors won't be rewarded. So not necessarily punishment learning, but learning like with the example of teaching a dog to sit, the behavioral inhibition system is what's teaching the dog that you don't get a treat every time you sit down. You only get a treat when you sit down when someone says sit. And then lastly, the behavioral inhibition system is responsible for processing and responding to unconditioned fear stimuli. So things that we naturally find scary without having to learn all of that is mediated by the behavioral inhibition system. So essentially both fear learning and unconditioned fear responses. So people who have a biological vulnerability to anxiety that's based in the behavioral inhibition system might have stronger behavioral inhibition system ac activation than behavioral activation system activation. Um, people who have dominance in the behavioral activation system are like our Everest climber guy here. They are reward seeking, they're novelty seeking, they aren't timid, they aren't sensitive to punishment and they have weaker unconditioned fear responses. So these are people who are brave risk takers but who might often put themselves in dangerous situations and who might have trouble learning from negative feedback in their environment. People who have strong behavioral inhib inhibition system activation are prone to anxiety. So they're prone to both unconditioned fear, so they're naturally more afraid of things and they are better at developing conditioned associations, so they're better at learning to fear new things. 
Um, and then lastly, the autonomic nervous system, specifically the sympathetic branch, is really implicated in the experience of fear and anxiety. And when the sympathetic nervous system is in charge, our behavior is more avoidant, our cognitions, our conscious experiences of anxiety, and we're more prone to panic, which is having an intense fear response. So to have a biological vulnerability to anxiety based in the sympathetic nervous system might mean that you have a more sensitive sympathetic nervous system. It's easier to trigger it into action. It could mean that your overall sympathetic response is stronger. So when cortisol is released in your blood by the HPA axis, it has a bigger effect on your organs. It causes your breathing to become faster than other people's. It causes your heart rate to increase more than other people's. It causes your gut to be paralyzed more than other people. It just causes a stronger fight or flight response. It could also cause a longer lasting fight or flight response, again, possibly because of a lack of negative feedback in the HPA axis or for other reasons that are based in the organs and the autonomic nervous system and not specifically in the HPA axis. But the other branch of the, of the autonomic nervous system is the parasympathetic nervous system. And the, the job of the PNS is to downregulate the SNS. So the sympathetic nervous system is not meant to be activated for long periods of time. It's only supposed to be activated in the presence of an acute threat. So as soon as that threat is gone, the parasympathetic nervous system is supposed to take over and downregulate all the functions of the sympathetic nervous system and bring the body back online to normal functions. While some people who are at risk to anxiety could be at risk because their parasympathetic nervous system is not as good at regulating the sympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic responses could last longer because the parasympathetic nervous system isn't good at shutting them down. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the environment and the importance of stress. So stress is important in creating risk for anxiety when it happens early in life, especially during really early childhood, but basically throughout development. So stress in childhood and adolescence in your early 20s, all of that while your brain is developing can increase your vulnerability to developing an anxiety disorder. So when stress during childhood is experienced by the child as controllable, the effect is less negative. So when the child experiences stress but feels like they can choose how to manage the stress or that they can take a break from the stress or escape from the stress when they need to, um, or when the cause of stress is something that they chose. So for example, um, as a teenager, being a varsity athlete and having a part-time job could both be sources of stress. But if you're a varsity athlete because you love playing football and you chose to do it and it's kind of your dream in life, that's stress that you chose and it's stress that you can control. If you have a part-time job because you're supporting your family and you know that if you lose your job, your younger siblings um, might not be able to eat or go to after school activities, that's uncontrollable stress. You can't choose to stop it. You can't choose to take a break from it. So that type of stress would have more of an impact on your risk of developing anxiety than the stress that would come from being a star football player. So it's not just the nature of the stress that matters, but it's also how parents respond to it. So parents can have a really big protective effect on the impact of stress on anxiety in childhood. If, even if the stress that your family is experiencing is uncontrollable, if your parents um, give you a sense of control over your environment. So even something as simple as like letting a child choose what clothes to wear to school or help pick out dinner, giving the kid a sense of control over their environment. Even if that environment is pretty stressful and chaotic, parents can help to buffer the impact of stress and give the child a sense of control over her life. Parents can also model um, taking control over stress. So if the family is going through a really stressful situation, but the, what the parents show is handling it, figuring out how to get out of it, um, taking concrete steps to make the situation better, that gives the child an experience of controllable stress. Whereas if the parents show the child maladaptive coping, avoidant coping, using substances, or just having like really intense anxiety responses in front of the child, that can make the child's experience of the stress more uncontrollable and more likely to lead to anxiety. So the last um, psychological vulnerability to developing anxiety disorders is cognitive. So it's our beliefs about the world. And these beliefs about the world um, are not things that we're born with. So these are not um, like inherent risk factors in the same way that biology can be. These are things that we learn from our environment um, and that we learn from our parents. But we can learn them in lots of different ways. 
So the beliefs that are most important to putting someone at risk for an anxiety disorder or really any psychopathology are, is the belief that the world is a really dangerous place and the belief that you're not in control of your own life. So like I was just talking about, when kids experience uncontrollable stress early on, it can teach them that the world is dangerous and that they can't control it. Or when they see their parents coping maladaptively with stress, when they see their parents having big stress responses to things that maybe aren't really that dangerous or that distressing objectively, like say seeing their parents, um, even seeing their parents like having anxiety disorders of their own. So seeing their parents um, freak out over a spider that's probably not strong enough to create the belief that the world is a dangerous place. But if parents consistently model anxiety responses and a lack of control to their children, they can teach the child that the world is dangerous and that adults can't control it. Another way that someone could develop these beliefs completely separately from parenting is if you have those biological vulnerabilities. So if your fight or flight system is constantly going off in the absence of real danger, you're gonna learn that the world is a dangerous place because you're going through your life constantly being scared. If you don't have a lot of control over your tendency to feel anxiety and panic, it's easy to learn that you can't control your life. So there are environmental con uh, contributors to these beliefs and there are biological contributors. And of course they also work together. So if you have biological vulnerability, but the adults in your life are good at helping you learn to manage it um, and model healthy coping with anxiety themselves that can mitigate the impact of your biological vulnerabilities. So as I've been getting at, these, these risk factors all interact and work together. So an example of a situation that creates anxiety disorders, that is currently creating anxiety disorders right now as we speak, is um, child separation and detention at the US-Mexico border. So the environment, the environmental stressor that these kids are experiencing is being separated from their parents at the border. Um, these kids are experiencing chronic stress. So they were experiencing stress even before they got to the border. Um, traveling through Mexico to emigrate here is a stressful situation. Um, but then once they got to the border, they were put in a situation that continues and perpetuates that chronic stress. So when you experience constant stress, constant cortisol activation, that can essentially wear out the receptors in your brain and pituitary that receive cortisol and that inhibits those neurons' responses. When those receptors are used too much, they become less sensitive. So even if you don't have a biological vulnerability to anxiety to begin with, experiencing chronic stress creates a biological vulnerability to anxiety by weakening the feedback of the HPA axis and making it more sensitive. So, the stress that these kids already experienced and now the stress that our government is putting them through is creating hyperactivity in their HPA axis. And because they're separated from their parents, they don't have the chance to have their parents buffer the impact of that stress through parenting. These kids are not being parented right now, which means that they're experiencing an environment that they have no control over. They don't have an adult to help create a sense of control in their life. And they're learning that the world is scary and that they can't control it. So this is an example of how regardless of pre-existing biological vulnerability, um, a stressful enough situation can create vulnerability to anxiety in anyone. So the three um, categories of risk to anxiety that we talked about and that the textbook talks about are biological, general psychological vulnerabilities, which have to do with beliefs, and then learning experiences. So biological risk factors are heritable. We get them from our parents. They Im mostly impact brain circuits and neurotransmitter systems. Biological vulnerabilities mediate the intensity and frequency of our experience of fear and anxiety from very early in life. And they also control our acquisition of fear learning. So they make it more or less likely that we'll form fearful conditioned associations from our environments. General psychological vulnerabilities um, come from both biological vulnerabilities and from parenting and modeling. And these are just our beliefs about the world, about how dangerous it is and how much we can control it. And then lastly, in order for really either biological or general psychological vulnerabilities to lead to an anxiety disorder, in most cases, we need some form of learning or some form of modeling. So we need exposure to a stressful or dangerous situation or modeling of vulnerability by caregivers. And 
depending on your level of biological and psychological risk, the dangerous situation that you're exposed to doesn't actually have to be objectively dangerous or it doesn't have to be something that most people would experience as dangerous. And for some people, it doesn't have to be an external danger at all. It can be an internal experience of sympathetic nervous system arousal in the form of a panic attack. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. So before we get into specific phobias, just a little overall epidemiology about anxiety disorders. They're really common. So the, the yearly prevalence of anxiety disorders is 18%. So at any given time, almost one in five people have an anxiety disorder over the age of 18. Um, fewer than half of those people ever get treated. So only about 36% of people get any form of treatment for anxiety. And that treatment may or may not be what we know to be the best evidence-based treatment for anxiety that we'll talk about in this lecture. So anxiety is often um, highly comorbid with other disorders, which makes sense because the prevalence of any disorder is 18.9% in the U.S. So it's not all anxiety disorders, but many people with an anxiety disorder also have another disorder. And the most common comorbidity in terms of mental health is depression. So this is just a visual representation of that. Um, this is the 18% of adults over 18 with anxiety. This is the 36% who ever get treated for their anxiety. And then the range of comorbidity is between 55 and 75%, but definitely more than half of people with anxiety have another disorder. And that can also be another anxiety disorder. Not, it doesn't have to be a, another category of disorder. So in addition to being highly comorbid with other mental illnesses, anxiety is really comorbid with medical conditions too. And especially medical conditions like GI issues, gastrointestinal issues, um, migraines and headaches, allergies and autoimmune disorders. And this is at least in part because anxiety, the experience of anxiety and chronic um, sympathetic nervous system arousal can cause gastrointestinal problems. It can cause migraines and it can um, put a stress on the immune system that can make us more likely to get sick. And then some people could contribute to triggering the development of an autoimmune condition. People with anxiety disorders often get anxious about the experience of um, physical symptoms too. So having an anxiety disorder can put you at greater risk for developing a comorbid medical condition, but then having that medical condition can also increase your level of anxiety. And the textbook points this out, that anxiety disorders have surprisingly high rates of suicide, um, comparable to depression. And as we'll talk about in our suicide lecture, um, suicide isn't specific to depression. And in fact, a, a lot of people who commit suicide don't have depression at the time. That being said, though, anxiety and depression have high comorbidity, and depression is a bigger risk factor for suicide than anxiety is. So a lot of the high prevalence of suicide and anxiety disorders could be more due to depression or to other factors that contribute to suicide in the absence of any diagnosed mental illness. Um, it could also have to do with the tendency to self-medicate anxiety with substances that reduce your inhibition and make it more likely that you'll act impulsively. All right. So that was just a whirlwind introduction to anxiety and fear disorders. But now we're going to jump in and talk about our first disorder of the semester, specific phobia, which I've kind of captioned the fear disorder because more than any other um, anxiety disorder, specific phobias really have to do with a immediate acute fear response and the sort of sequelae of that. All right, so what is a specific phobia? The uh, DSM definition of a specific phobia is an excessive fear of a specific object or situation that exceeds the actual danger posed by that object or situation. So the fear has to be, according to the DSM, this is a quotation, unreasonable and excessive. The person has to have an immediate fear or anxiety response when they encounter the stimulus or the situation. Um, they have to either engage in um, avoidance of that stimulus or situation or experience a lot of distress when they are exposed to it. And of course, it has to be impairing. So this is really important in phobias because phobias are really common. Um, the yearly prevalence of phobias is almost 9%. So almost one in 10 people every year meets criteria for a phobia. And about 13% of people meet criteria um, at some point in their life. 
And as you can see, the difference between 9% and 12% isn't that great. So that suggests that there's not a lot of change in um, who meets criteria for a phobia. So phobias tend to start early in life, and if they're not treated, they pretty much last forever. Um, they need to be treated in order to go away. So diagnosed phobias are more common in women. Um, the, the statistic the textbook gives is a four to one ratio of uh, women to men with phobias. That differs a little bit depending on the, the category of phobia. But the important thing to note here is that phobias are both really um, chronic they tend to start early and last a really long time, but they're also really common. So if we think back to that um, diagram that came up in the last lecture, showing a symptom or a trait with every, most people some, falling somewhere in the middle in levels of that symptom or trait, and then only a small number of people being on the high end, the number of people who are on the high end of specific phobias is surprisingly large. And that suggests that there's also a lot of people who are close to that high end but not meeting criteria all the way. So all of this is just a way to say that having specific fears of objects or situations is really common. Um, it only meets criteria for a phobia if it causes impairment. So plenty of people, probably some people in this class have something like a fear of heights or a fear of small animals like spiders or roaches or rats that would cause a lot of distress if you were in that situation, but that is an easy situation to avoid without really modifying or changing your life. Um, so it wouldn't be criteria for a phobia because avoiding it isn't impacting your life negatively and avoiding it is also not necessarily making the phobia worse in ways that we'll talk about in a few slides. So phobias are really common, in other words. And in a second, we'll talk about why they might be so common. But first, um, there are five categories of object or situation that people are often afraid of. So these are the most common kinds. Um, natural environment phobias, including heights, which is one of the most common single phobias. Um, other natural environment phobias can include things like big open spaces, it can, it can include um, enclosed spaces, it can include deep water. So, oh, it can include thunderstorms in the dark. So phobias of um, situations in the environment, situations outside, that falls under the natural environment category. Blood injection injury phobia is possibly one of the single biggest, most common phobias of a single like situation or object. It typically involves um, a phobia of either the sight of blood, so your own blood or someone else's, or um, phobias of getting injections or having blood drawn, so phobias of needles. Animal phobias as a broad category are common, but um, different people are afraid of different animals. So small animals like insects and rodents are the biggest phobic objects, but phobias of dogs are also really common. Situational phobias is kind of a broad category, but some of the most common situational phobias are things like phobias of the dentist or phobias of um, driving in general, or a lot of people have specific phobias of driving over bridges. Um, situational phobias can also involve phobias of being trapped, so like being in a situation that you can't easily get out of. Oh, another big situational phobia is flying. And then there's another category, um, which includes a lot of phobias that aren't, that are common and impairing, but not as well studied, like phobia of vomiting, uh, phobia of choking. And then there's a whole world of odd or unusual phobias that are more common in people with autism and developmental disorders that include things like clowns or balloons or costumed characters like mascots. Um, these phobias are more common, as I said, in kids with developmental disorders or with sensory sensitivities. And I think we'll talk, we will talk more about why in the autism and developmental disorders lectures. Um, but essentially it's because kids with autism have a different sensory experience of the world than everyone else. They have heightened sensory sensitivity. So because of their sensory sensitivity, they might experience um, things that are like really sensorily overwhelming, like clowns and balloons as more intense than other kids. And so those situations might actually cause fear for them. So where do phobias come from? Um, so these are some of the common phobias, blood, heights, dogs, um, snakes. And what these things have in common is that they all can be dangerous. So to not even to a certain extent. It's rational to be afraid of high places. It's rational to be afraid of some snakes. It's rational to be wary about blood. 
And it's rational to be scared of dogs. Um, dogs are actually such a common phobic object because, as I said, phobias tend to develop in young kids. And even dogs that are friendly tend to have bad boundaries. So, and dogs also tend to be bigger than some little kids. So when you're a toddler and you go over to someone's house who has a dog, that dog is jumping all over everyone because it's happy to see them. But you're a little kid, so you don't know that the dog is happy. You're just experiencing this animal that's bigger than you lunging at you and trying to sit on you. And that's a really scary experience. So most phobias are of things that are actually objectively scary. And that's why phobias are so common. But a phobia really is only a phobia when the phobic reaction is in inappropriate to the actual level of danger. So it's rational to be scared of heights, but it's arguably not that rational to be scared of going to the top floor of a building or being in a glass elevator. Like I said, phobias of dogs are rational and you, it's understandable where they come from in little kids, but by the time you're an adult, um, if you're afraid of a dog that fits in a purse, that's oops, not proportional to the actual threat. Um, blood injection injury phobia is really impairing because it can interfere with getting a lot of medical procedures. And if you're, Fear of snakes is so generalized that you're constantly scanning the environment for danger and jumping at the sight of anything that looks like a snake, like a garden hose, that would also be impairing. So specific phobias are only diagnosed when a fear, even a fear of something that is in some cases really rational and makes a lot of sense, becomes excessive and generalized and causes distress and dysfunction. So I'm going to talk about two examples of um, impairment from specific phobias actually stemming from avoidance. So phobias are characterized by avoidance. You have to either avoid or experience the situation with distress to meet criteria for a phobia. But in many cases, the actual avoidance itself perpetuates the phobia and makes it worse. So a great example of this is dental phobia. Um, this is from a study that I did or was involved in a long time ago in grad school. But basically what we did was had every single patient at a huge dental practice in New York City just rate their fear of going to the dentist on a 1 to 10 scale. So it was a really simple question. Um, about 75% of people rated their fear as minimal, so a 1 to 4 on the 1 to 10 distress scale. Um, and then about 25% of people experienced moderate to severe dental phobia. So the number of people actually experiencing what might be considered clinical dental phobia ranged from between 2.5%, so those are people who scored 10 out of 10 on the dental fear scale, to about 4.5%, so those, those are people who scored between 8 and 10 on the dental fear, dental fear scale. So even though most people don't fear the dentist, the fact that 4.5% of people who are at the dentist fear the dentist suggests that dental phobia is really common. So the, we would expect that the prevalence of dental phobia among people who aren't currently at the dentist might even be higher. And we would expect that because when we asked the people who said that they were really afraid of the dentist, when was the last time you actually saw the dentist? Um, it was longer ago. So people who are afraid of the dentist are less likely to get routine dental care, like cleanings and exams. And when we surveyed them at the dentist, they were more likely to be there because they were experiencing pain or were having a dental emergency. So they avoid routine dental care and only go to the dentist when it's an emergency and they absolutely have to. And because of that, because they're avoiding routine dental care, when they do go to the dentist, they tend to need more extensive dental work. So avoiding the dentist because of dental phobia actually reinforces the fear because when you do go to the dentist, you need more work done, you're in pain, it's a scarier situation than a routine dental cleaning would be. If people who are afraid of the dentist went to the dentist for routine cleanings, they would have a lot more positive experiences with the dentist where they go and nothing scary happens. Instead, they avoid the dentist and when they do go, their fears are confirmed. It's terrible, they have to get Novocaine and they have to have dental surgeries. So their fear of the dentist is reinforced by avoidance and the consequences of avoidance. I'm gonna take a quick drink. Okay. So another um, specific phobia that's really characterized by extremely pervasive and maladaptive avoidance is emetophobia or specific fear of vomiting. So um, we actually, we don't really know the prevalence of emetophobia, partly because it's, it's not actually listed in the DSM, it's just under the other phobia category. Um, it's pretty understudied, but one epidemiological study found 
about 0.5 to 0.7 percent of adults have specific phobia of vomiting. But another study that looked at not specific phobia, but just sort of excessive fear, so similar to this dentist study, um, people who score between like 8 and 10 on a fear of vomiting scale, that's about 2 to 7 percent of people. And the range is because it's more common in women, so it's closer to 7 percent of women and closer to 2 percent of men endorsing fear of vomiting. And fear of vomiting is, like many phobias, likely to be more common in kids. So emetophobia leads to really pervasive situational avoidance. So people will avoid medical procedures and taking medicine that might have nausea as a side effect. People with emetophobia will avoid travel and activities because they don't want to get sick when they're in a situation where they can't escape from or where they can't control. Um, a lot of women with emetophobia will avoid getting pregnant even if they want to have children because they fear um, nausea from morning sickness. And then people of all genders with emetophobia might avoid having children because they fear having to deal with their children's illnesses. So the most common form of avoidance though in emetophobia, and one of the reasons why I'm so interested in it, is eating. So people with emetophobia, they fear the act of vomiting, but along with that comes really pervasive fear of a lot of internal sensations that they might attribute to nausea or might think predict vomiting. So a lot of people with emetophobia will limit the amount of food they eat or they'll limit the number of types of food they eat to try to make it less likely that they'll get sick. And because of that, emetophobia is one of the most common causes of diagnosed ARFID, which we'll talk about in the eating disorders lectures a couple months or a couple weeks from now. So this is a first person perspective of someone talking about the impact that their emetophobia has on their functioning. So we talked before about how there are different domains of psychosocial functioning, including work, um, school and job performance, relationships, so parents and family and social functioning, so how avoidance might impact on enjoying your social life. So this person with emetophobia is going to talk about one of the ways that it impacts her functioning. So for me, emetophobia is quite difficult because Sorry. I have children and children have a tendency to pick up more viruses than adults because their immune systems aren't fully developed. So over the years since we had Super Kid, who is now 12, we have had a fair few incidents of sickness and vomiting in our house. And I have found that very challenging. So when someone is sick, or I hear someone being sick, or I hear of someone having been sick somewhere in my circle of life, it makes me feel extremely anxious and panicked. If someone who lives in my house is being sick, it makes me feel extremely panicked and sometimes it can make me appear angry. Now, I don't think that I've ever made my children feel that I'm angry at them for being sick because I've always managed to take that away and express it somewhere else. But I know that they do know that mom isn't good with sick and they tend to go to their dad if they need support in that area. And I don't really like that, but I accept that they're probably right because it's not something that I handle very well. So the impairment that she's talking about there stems from avoidance. Um, she, in her case, the avoidance she's talking about is just avoiding being around people who are sick, who are throwing up. Um, but that avoidance is really impairing her in her role as a parent because she is avoiding being around her own children when they're sick. So she's expressing both impairment from that. She knows that it's impairing her functioning as a parent, but she's also experiencing distress because of that, because she feels like she's not doing the best she can towards her children. So that's one example of how avoidance from a phobia can increase impairment. Um, man, I'm going to have to learn how to advance the slides. All right. So another example of a metaphobia related avoidance and distress it actually comes from Reddit. So there's a really active emetophobia subreddit, and a lot of it is just people actively seeking reassurance because they're feeling really anxious about getting sick. So they go online and describe their symptoms and just ask people to tell them that it's going to be okay and that they're not going to throw up. So this is just one example. I literally just went on and grabbed one of the first ones I saw. 
So this person is saying that the past few days have been really stressful for them and they have, they've been having a headache for a while. They're posting this at four in the morning and they're saying, of course, because they have a headache, they have nausea. So N stands for nausea and this person is so avoidant that they won't even say words like nausea or throw up or sick. Um, this is really common in emetophobia. So it's avoidance that really goes beyond just avoiding like situations that involve actual vomiting. It, it, it's avoidance of even thinking about vomiting or even speaking about vomiting. So the person says, the thing is, I feel like throwing up. Um, since I skipped dinner, their mom says it's probably just hunger, but to them it feels different. They think they're actually going to vomit. So they're online seeking reassurance. They're engaging in avoidance of eating, which, as I said, is really common in emetophobia. And their avoidance is so pervasive that they won't even say words that have to do with emetophobia. So we'll talk in a few slides from now about how um, avoidance doesn't just characterize phobias. It's not just a symptom of phobias, but it's actually one of the factors that maintains them. This um, Reddit post, though, is also a really good example of the kind of the level of distress that people experience when they're encountering their phobic situation. And it's kind of an example of why emetophobia is actually one of the most impairing severe phobias. Because unlike dental phobia, where not that you should, but you can avoid going for routine dental cleanings and hope that you get lucky and don't have very many dental emergencies in your life. Not only is throwing up kind of inevitable as a human, but people with emetophobia tend to develop fear that's so generalized that they attribute every bodily sensation to nausea. So it's really common for people with emetophobia to not be able to tell the difference between hunger and nausea. Any sensation in their stomach is interpreted as nausea. Um, also, of course, when you're really anxious, when your sympathetic nervous system is activated, it causes your digestive system to really slow down. So you're when you're anxious, it can actually cause you to feel nausea. So it becomes a really vicious cycle. So let's talk about where phobias come from. So as I said, phobias are almost always of objects or situations that are really dangerous or really scary in certain settings. So Phobias can come from direct experience. So someone could develop a metaphobia because they had a bad experience or really any experience of throwing up in childhood. Um, or like with the dog example, you could develop a phobia of dogs because an overexcited pit bull jumped on you when you were a two-year-old. Um, so that's classical conditioning. Dogs to a greater degree than vomiting, but really both of those things, they can be dangerous sometimes but most of the time they're not dangerous. So they're not necessarily unconditioned stimuli. It's not like um, everyone would have the same fear reaction to those stimuli. You have to learn to have that fear reaction by having an experience paired with an unconditioned fear response. You can also develop a phobia through vicarious experience. So as I said, vomit and also choking phobias are the most common causes of avoid and restrictive food intake disorder. And in people with avoidant restrictive food intake disorder from those phobias, it's about 50-50 with half of them having experienced vomiting or choking themselves and half having actually seen someone else vomit or choke. So one example would be a patient who developed a choking phobia after seeing her grandmother who had had a stroke and had real swallowing dysfunction choke at the dinner table. So even though that's not an experience that's happening to you, it's what's known as a vicarious experience where it happens to someone else and that can still be a conditioned stimulus for the, for the development of a specific phobia. And then lastly, um, phobias can come from explicit teaching. So if you are someone who has a lot of vulnerability to anxiety and you have a parent who, uh, teach, who tells you to stay away from dogs, who says, you know, like most parents of little kids do, like be careful around dogs, don't go running up to them, don't stick your hand in their mouth, like don't let them get overly excited. That's a common thing for parents to say to kids, but for a kid with a vulnerability to developing phobias, sometimes just that can be enough for them to develop a fear. Parents can also model fears. So um, the, the YouTuber who was talking about her emetophobia talked about how her kids know that she's afraid of vomiting. So it doesn't sound like her kids have emetophobia, but in kids with enough vulnerability, seeing your mother panic when you get sick could be enough to teach you to fear vomiting too. And that's also classical conditioning 
in that when someone instructs you that you should be afraid of something, you're more likely to have a fear reaction the next time you encounter that situation because that's what you were told to do. And so that fear reaction that you have in the situation paired with exposure to the situation can create a classically conditioned fear association. So why do we all have phobias of things that are actually dangerous in, in some way or things that are um, potentially dangerous? Primates, including people, are prepared to develop phobias of certain things. So phobias are evolutionarily conserved. Um, our ancestors had phobias and for our ancestors having phobias um, or having being able to develop conditioned fears of things actually increase their survival and reproduction. And that's because it's beneficial for people living in a dangerous environment to quickly learn to fear things that could hurt them without having to have too many pairings of um, feeling fear around that thing. You really only want to encounter a tiger one time before you develop a fear of it and stay away from tigers for the rest of your life. So preparedness is an evolutionary adaptation. People are prepared to learn to fear certain things more than others. And one demonstration of that was done, it was a study done with baby monkeys. So these monkeys had been raised in the lab. They'd never encountered um, their natural monkey environment, which for this species was the jungle. So for this species of monkeys, snakes are one of their main predators, but they also live in an environment that has a lot of flowering trees and plants. So the researchers wanted to see is it easier for monkeys to develop a fear of snakes, which are dangerous, than flowers, which are ubiquitous in their environment, but not dangerous? So they took these baby monkeys who'd never experienced either snakes or flowers, and they exposed them, one group of monkeys to toy snakes and one group of monkeys to toy flowers. And the snake or the flower was always paired with a really loud, scary noise. So in these studies, the snake and the flower were, un were conditioned stimuli, and the loud noise was the conditioned stimulus. Sorry, the snake and the flower were conditioned stimuli. They, didn't, they did not have any valence before. Before they were paired with the loud noise, which is the unconditioned stimulus, monkeys weren't afraid of either one of them. So after some pairings with the loud noise, the monkeys did develop fears of both snakes and flowers, but it took fewer pairings with the loud noise for them to start fearing the snakes, even in the absence of the loud noise. It took more trials, so more pairings of flowers and loud noises for monkeys to start to fear flowers. Also, over time, as the monkeys were repeatedly presented with these stimuli in the absence of the scary loud noise, the fear of flowers actually faded away, but the fear of snakes remained. So this is just a demonstration that there are certain objects, typically objects that would have been dangerous in our envir environment of evolutionary adaptation, that humans and primates are prepared to learn to be afraid of. So with an example we've already talked about, the example of little Hans, um, the two process model of phobias, so the behavioral learning model of phobias, suggests that phobias are developed through classical conditioning. So with little Hans, horses were unconditioned stimuli before he saw one die. So the horse had no value before this pairing, but after this pairing, where he saw death for the first time, it really freaked him out, and also adults around him got upset, he had an unconditioned response, not to the horse, but to the fact that it died and to how upset he saw adults around him getting. So there was an unconditioned, there was just a direct experience of something bad happening with a horse, but also um, some learning and also some vicarious conditioning because he also saw other people having a really big fear reaction and getting upset. So his reaction to the death might not have been as strong if he hadn't seen adults around him being upset. So through this one pairing, Hans developed a fear of horses. So even after this event, when he saw a horse, even though nothing bad was happening with it anymore, he still had that conditioned response. He still had that fear response to seeing the horse that he experienced for the first time in the presence of death and people's reactions to death. So this is the two process model of how phobias develop. The first process is classical conditioning. But then the second process is operant conditioning. So we talked a little bit about operant conditioning um, last week in class, but the classical example of operant conditioning is training animals to engage in a behavior 
that helps them escape from a negative situation. So you can train mice to press a lever through negative reinforcement. They're in a cage where the floor is electrified, so the floor is delivering painful shocks. And when they press the lever, that makes the shock go off. It makes the pain go away. So eventually, while they're in this environment, the mice will accidentally press the lever. They'll just sort of randomly do it while they're exploring their cage. But when they do that behavior, they'll notice that they're no longer in pain. So the next time the pain comes back, when the floor is electrified again, the mice will go to press the lever to escape from the pain. That lever pressing behavior is reinforced by escape. So in the case of anxiety, when someone is experiencing anxiety and they engage in avoidance, so for Hans, when he was outside and saw a horse, when he engaged in avoidance, when he started crying and asking to be taken back inside, his parents complied and they took him inside and his anxiety decreased because he was no longer around the phobic object. He was no longer around horses. So what he was learning from that was anytime he sees a horse, the best way to get away from the fear that it caused is to escape and avoid. And this figure shows how that avoidance cycle actually maintains anxiety. So anxiety is uncomfortable and it's totally natural for us to want to avoid it, to want to escape it. And escaping from something that's making you afraid is actually the adaptive response if that thing is actually dangerous. However, the thing about phobias is, is that we're having a fear reaction to something that's not actually dangerous. And if you resist the urge to escape, if you stay in the situation with that thing that's making you afraid, but that isn't actually dangerous. So if you have a phobia of dogs, if you go over to a friend's house and their dog starts jumping on you, your impulse might be to ask your friend to put the dog away, to go back outside, to avoid seeing your friend at their house so that you don't have to experience that dog. Um, if you actually stay in the situation and let the dog keep jumping on you, nothing bad is going to happen because a phobia is a fear of a situation that's not actually dangerous. So over time, as you realize that nothing is happening, your parasympathetic nervous system will come back online. It will cause the fight or flight response to shut down because that response is meant to be temporary. It's meant to help you escape a real danger. So as soon as your brain realizes that there's no real danger, you'll experience what's called habituation, where your, your parasympathetic nervous system will downregulate your sympathetic nervous system, and the conscious experience of panic and anxiety will decrease. However, if you escape from the situation um, before habituation can happen, so every time you see your friend with the dog, you run away, you cross the street, you ask them to put the dog outside, um, your anxiety will actually go down a lot faster because the danger has gone away. So rather than slowly coming down as you realize that there's no danger, you escape right away. But what that's doing is reinforcing that the only way to get away from the fear of that situation is to escape. And it's reinforcing escape behavior, which is sort of teaching yourself that the situation is actually dangerous when it's not. So the two process model of um, phobias is the basis for our treatment of phobias, which is exposure therapy. So it's actually helping people to practice putting themselves in situations where they're encountering the thing that they're afraid of, where they're experiencing their phobic situation or encountering their phobic object and resisting the impulse to escape and instead confronting it until their anxiety starts to habituate on its own. So this is an example of um, a, friend from mine, a friend of mine from grad school doing exposure therapy for one of his colleagues who has a fear of roaches. I am terribly afraid of cockroaches. When I see one, I become a different person. I sort of become paralyzed. My heart starts racing. I have trouble breathing and I freak out everybody around me. And I think they are the grossest things on the planet. I met Dr. Fran and he mentioned exposure therapy. So I thought I'd try it. He's going to cure me of my fears of roaches. So whatever happened that, that made you afraid of this, I think we talked about this a little bit. You were, had a bad experience in an apartment that you were renting, it was infested with roaches, they were everywhere, you didn't really feel safe. Yeah. And before that, you didn't, you weren't comfortable with them, but didn't have the same intense fear. Afterwards, now they're pretty scary. Yeah. All right, are you ready to handle some big roaches? Yeah, okay. All right, hand up. Ready? Okay. I'm so clammy. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Oh All right, okay. <laughs> So she's okay, having a fear reaction oh, to something that's, that's definitely not dangerous, to a fake roach. <laughs> she knows it's fake, but her body is reacting to it like it's real. Um, I felt pretty safe, but I uh, was a lot more nervous than I thought I would be. Um, and I'm having trouble like calming down, and then I, I discovered I was sweating a little. <laughs> 
It's like having a physiological fear reaction to a fake roach. I can't decide if I'm stupid or like, or, or if this, this doesn't make any sense to me right now. I know it makes sense, but right now it doesn't make sense. So right there, she's doing something that for her is scarier than handling a fake roach. So in the first session, she held a fake roach for just a few seconds and then threw it away. So she was able to sit with it for a couple seconds before engaging in avoidance. Now, a couple sessions later, she's holding a dead roach and she's holding it longer. So what this is showing is that as she repeatedly puts herself in situations where she's confronting the phobic object, her initial fear reaction to situations that cause anxiety is getting less and less and she's able to experience more and more intense exposures to the thing that she's afraid of. So people with small animal phobias tend to be really bothered by the way that the animal moves. So for most people, um, looking at still images or dead versions of the animal is less scary than seeing it move. Yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. That's gross. Would you like to take these guys home with you? No. <laughs> Will you take them home? Yeah, I'll take them home. <laughs> I haven't opened it yet. I've had it in my pocketbook for a week, so it's probably not going to be in very good shape. But we're going to explore. Okay. I can do this. You can do it. Here's our, our friend, the roach, the Drogon. In his little tiny Swiss container right now, and he's crawling on this paper towel. And we're going to take the paper towel out. <laughs> and have Julie handle the paper towel. <laughs> I feel I really gonna, feel trapped. I'm gonna do this very slowly. Oh my god! Okay. It's just anxiety, right? So you can let that wave of anxiety come over you and now how does it feel to have this thing? So Julie did a great job with the previous exposure, which was pretty challenging. And now we're actually going to have her go into this room here and we're going to let a different roach out. I'm going to be in there with her at first. And then when she's ready, I'm going to come out um, and we'll track your level of anxiety all along the way. Ready, ready, ready. All right. Five minutes. Okay, can I, it's really hot. <laughs> no, it's really hot. Do you, you want to stop for now? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pop them. Good. Okay. I got you. <laughs> Julie's exposure therapy experience, I would say, is pretty average. Had a pretty normal course of treatment. She struggled with some things, but that's totally normal. Um, and she was very brave. And overall, I think that she did a great job. She ended up in a place where she wanted to be, in a place where fear of roaches really doesn't uh, impact her day to day life as much as it did before. This experience with exposure therapy has been incredibly surprising. I really, truly, going into this, never thought that I would make the kind of progress that I have. I can't say that it was fun. I mean, it wasn't terrible all the time, but it was definitely hard. But I really can see the value in it, and I really feel like um, my life is going to be easier because of it. All right. So that was just an example of how um, psychologists treat phobias.
So, and I will learn this one day. Okay, to click. I, nope, that doesn't work. Okay, I have to click twice. Okay, so that was a video showing exposure in action, but how does it work? So just like th there's a two process model for developing phobias, um, conditioned associations, and then learned avoidance, there's also two processes involved in the treatment and the cure of phobias. So the first process is habituation. This half of the process is unconscious and physiological. It happens passively. So it's similar to a, developing a conditioned association in that there's no conscious behavior involved. There's no intentional behavior. What happens if you expose yourself long enough to a situation that is not changing, even if the situation initially feels scary, if the threat doesn't increase or change, over time, your body will stop responding to it. And that's just because your body is efficient. It doesn't want to keep producing a fear response to a situation that's not actually fearful, not actually dangerous. So one of the biggest um, ways that our environment catches our attention and causes changes in our physiology is change and novelty. So if you put yourself in a situation that's not changing, so like what Julie was doing with initially holding a plastic cockroach, she had a big fear reaction to that at first, but eventually when she kept holding onto it enough and didn't avoid, nothing more was happening. So she had the initial fear, but then there was nothing that was continuing to happen that was continuing to make that cockroach seem like a threat. So eventually over time when the stimuli is not changing and there's no evidence that it's dangerous, the parasympathetic nervous system will take back over and start to downregulate the sympathetic nervous system activity. And we experience that consciously as calming down, as our fear levels slowly starting to taper off and then decline. And then eventually we're feeling calm and normal in the presence of the, the stimulus that used to make us feel afraid. So the second process is safety learning. So where a situation is happening at an unconscious physiological level, safety learning is more conscious. So what a phobia really is, is a fear of danger. So we're afraid that the phobic object or situation is gonna hurt us. Or more often, um, it's a fear that we'll experience levels of anxiety that are just intolerable. So like Julie knows that cockroaches aren't going to hurt her, but she feels like she can't tolerate the anxiety that they cause without escaping. And a lot of people will think that anxiety will just go up and up and up and continue to increase if you don't do something about it, that you might go crazy or even have a heart attack if you let yourself get too anxious. And that's just not true. We know from habituation that if we're anxious in the presence of a threat that's not actually dangerous and that isn't changing, what will eventually happen is that our anxiety will peak and, and go down. Anxiety will always go down. It's impossible to die from being too anxious, but a lot of people don't know that because when you're really anxious, it can really feel like you're gonna die. So when you do an exposure to something that you're afraid of and don't escape, what you're learning is that it's not really dangerous. So you're sort of teaching your brain that this, this plastic cockroach is not gonna hurt you, but you're teaching yourself that you, the anxiety that you experience is tolerable. And you're learning that if you sit with it long enough, if you stay in the situation without avoiding long enough, your anxiety will naturally go down on its own. So you're teaching yourself both that the phobic object isn't dangerous and also that your own anxiety isn't dangerous. So in the context of an exposure, when Julie was doing her last exposure to being in, in a room with a cockroach, her goal was to get close enough to capture it. And as she was left alone in this room, her anxiety climbed and climbed and climbed. She was saying that she was hot. She was like screaming and kind of panicking a little bit. And she had a really strong urge to get away from that anxiety quickly, like escape right away. And had she run out of the room, leaving the cockroach like loose in there, she would have felt better right away because she had gotten away from the situation. So her anxiety would have dropped really quickly, but she wouldn't have experienced habituation. So she wouldn't have been able to teach her body that cockroaches aren't a dangerous stimulus, that if you stay around them long enough, the danger level doesn't increase. So therefore it's something that you can ignore. And she wouldn't be teaching herself that she can tolerate her anxiety and that she can be around cockroaches long enough to experience that habituation without needing to escape and also without anything bad happening as a result of her anxiety. So that's what you learn with exposure. And the way that exposure therapy is structured, just like for Julie, it starts out with an exposure that the patient thinks will be scary, but it's not necessarily the scariest experience they can think of. So like someone with a dog phobia, an early exposure might be playing with a stuffed dog toy or maybe looking at pictures of dogs. And then you would climb the ladder. So another exposure might be looking at videos of dogs attacking people 
um, or it might be going to a dog park and standing outside the fence. And then you would increase the level of fear. So you might go inside the fence at the dog park or you might interact with a small dog. And then your ultimate biggest fear might be interacting with a big dog. So you would do that at the end once you had encountered all of your smaller fears. And what tends to happen as it did with Julie is that once you've habituated and sort of overcome a lower level fear, it makes it easier to encounter a higher level fear the next time. So we've been talking a lot about fear in the context of phobia and phobias really are characterized by fear. They're disorders of fear. They are characterized by having inappropriate fear responses to condition stimuli. But fear is not the only emotion involved in, in specific phobias. Disgust is involved too, as we saw with Julie. She was obviously scared of the cockroaches. She was having a lot of sympathetic arousal where she was sweating and shaking um, and screaming, but she was also expressing a lot of disgust. So some of the biggest um, disgust triggers that are also phobic objects are blood, um, small animals like insects and snakes and rodents, and vomiting in emetophobia. So the um, phobias that tend to be characterized by a mixture of fear and disgust are blood injection injury phobia, emetophobia, small animal insect phobia. As we'll talk about in a couple of lectures, disgust is also really important in contamination OCD. Okay, so we talked a little bit in the beginning of the lecture about where fear comes from and why fear is adaptive and why it was conserved. Well, disgust is adaptive too, as we talked about in the emotions lecture, we know it's a conserved behavior because it's universal to humans. Like um, evolutionary psychologist Megan Williams was saying, one way we know that something evolved is if it's universal, if all humans do it. So if you show this disgust face to a member of the Hadza who has never interacted with people from America before, they would still be able to say that she is disgusted. Another way we know that something is evolutionarily conserved is if it's not only universal to humans, but if we can see analogs of it in species that we are less closely related to, that we share a distant ancestor with. So this is a rat experiencing disgust. And you might have to take my word for it a little bit, but the rat is actually making the same exact facial expression as this woman is making. Um, scientists call this expression the disgust gape. It's different than the disgust sneer, which is this. So there's actually two disgust expressions. But the disgust gape is the expression that a rat will make, for example, when it's exposed to a flavor that you've trained it to be disgusted by, by pairing that flavor with nausea. So rats are trained to form conditioned associations to tastes by letting them taste something that they've never tasted before and then giving them an injection of lithium chloride, which makes them feel nauseous. And after one pairing of a new taste and an unconditioned, stim unconditioned stimulus, nausea, rats will develop a disgust response to that taste. And the disgust gape involves wrinkling your nose, raising your top palate, so kind of like opening up the back of your throat, your tongue kind of going down in the back and up in the front, and um, opening your mouth slightly. And if you make that expression for yourself, just try to copy her expression. What, you'll, what you might notice is that when you make that facial expression, your tongue is blocking off the back of your throat and opening the front of your mouth so that you're prepared to spit out whatever's in your mouth. And it would also be difficult to swallow anything while you're making that face. So humans universally tend to find the same kinds of things disgusting, but at the same time, most disgust responses are conditioned. So humans in basically every culture and civilization find human feces disgusting. But infants don't. Infants will play with their own feces and toddlers will stick their hands in their own diaper. And it's not until age three or four that kids start to express disgust at their own bodily waste. So even though humans are prepared to find certain things disgusting, which we know because disgust triggers are universal, that disgust has to be learned. And in the case of feces, it's usually learned through modeling. So parents acting disgusted when the kid paints the wall with their diaper or taught. So parents saying, it's gross to stick your hands in your diaper. Don't do that anymore. It could make you sick. So the only unconditioned disgust response that humans or animals seem to have is food neophobia. So this is experiencing disgust in the presence or at, triggered by a totally unfamiliar food. And adults don't experience food neophobia that often because we've been exposed to most foods in our environment already. But infants express neophobia at every new food. And this cat here is demonstrating 
um, a neophobic response to an inappropriate food. So because food neophobia is the only disgust response that we don't have to learn, scientists think that food neophobia is actually the origin of disgust and that the function of disgust in our evolutionary environment was to protect us from ingesting foods that might not be safe for us to eat. And then all the other functions of disgust kind of came along with that, but disgust may have evolved originally to protect us from ingesting dangerous food. Okay, so as we've talked about, fear is totally a sympathetic response. It involves complete activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. So things like rapid heart rate, it's not shown here, but sweating. So that comes from the secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Total digestive shutdown, um, increased rate of breathing. All of these things are caused by the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system though mediates disgust. Um, so some of the disgust responses that we have are actually the opposite of fear responses. So whereas when we're afraid, we experience rapid heart rate and high blood pressure, when we're feeling disgusted, our blood pressure actually drops. Also, so sympathetic arousal shuts down gastric activity. It basically directs all the blood flow away from the stomach and causes it to kind of stop contracting altogether. With disgust, our stomach is still contracting, but it's actually a really characteristic pattern of stomach contractions that's unique to disgust. And it's called bradygastria, which means slow, steady gastric contractions. And you've experienced that before as stomach churning, so that sort of slow, regular, like, I mean, it feels nauseating. So basically when you're nauseous, that feeling of like your stomach kind of flipping over, that's bradygastria. And that is mediated by your parasympathetic nervous system. So disgust kind of involves an opposite nervous system reaction to fear. So we do do exposure therapy for phobic objects that cause disgust. So Julie was disgusted by cockroaches, but she was also really afraid of them. So what tends to happen when you do exposure therapy for someone who has a phobia that involves both fear and disgust is that exposure works great for fear. So this is someone, oops, this first one is an example of blood injection injury phobia. So someone who's afraid of blood or needles, early on they express a lot of disgust. So, well, not like a ton. These are actually subclinical, so they don't actually have a phobia. They just have elevated fear. So they're reporting a both fear and disgust between 35 and 40 out of 100. But after repeated exposures to images or simulations or actual needles and blood, they experience a big drop in fear. So like a 20 point decrease in how afraid they are of those stimuli. And while they experience some decrease in disgust, it's not as great. So after repeated exposure, their level of fear is pretty minimal, but their level of disgust is still fairly significant. It's only really dropped by maybe less than 10 points, maybe five. And the same happens with um, disgust and fear for spiders and in individuals who have subclinical spider phobia. So why might this be? Disgust decreases with exposure much more slowly than fear. Exposure is a great treatment for fear. It really works to get rid of um, conditioned inappropriate fears, but it doesn't seem to get rid of disgust completely. So we know that exposure works through habituation and safety learning. And we can ask, does disgust respond less to exposure because it habituates differently? Well, um, disgust involves activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, not the sympathetic nervous system. And habituation happens when the sympathetic nervous system is naturally downregulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is only supposed to be activated temporarily for brief periods until either we've escaped from the danger or we've realized that the danger is not actually dangerous. On the other hand, disgust is mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the branch of our nervous system that's activated most of the time. So it's possible that exposure just doesn't work as well on disgust because habituation works through learning, through letting our bodies physiologically learn to downregulate sympathetic activity in the presence of that phobic object. But with disgust, there's no sympathetic activity. The sympathetic activity is only coming from the fear. So it could just be that disgust doesn't habituate because habituation involves shutting down the sympathetic nervous system. It could also be that there are adaptive reasons for this. So maybe disgust should be a longer lasting emotion than fear. Fear is the emotion we experience when we're about to die, like when a tiger is running at us. So as soon as we've escaped from that tiger, as soon as we've like climbed a tree, I don't know if tigers can climb trees, 
But as soon as we've escaped from, from the tiger, we don't have any reason to be afraid anymore. The danger has passed. With disgust though, um, the things that cause us to be disgusted are things that, that have germs that carry a contagion. So we're disgusted by human waste because human waste has a lot of germs and disease causing potential. So even once we've gotten rid of the actual stimulus that was making us disgusted, those germs are still hanging around. So the inhibitory behaviors that are produced by disgust, which mostly tend to focus on inhibiting um, ingestion. So make, like when you're feeling disgusted, you don't want to eat. That's the biggest sign of disgust. So ongoing oral inhibition, even after the initial trigger for disgust is removed, could have been really adaptive because our ancestors were hunter gatherers. If they came across a rotting carcass in the field and experienced disgust at that, that experience of disgust would make them less likely to eat that rotting carcass, even if they were really, really hungry. So having that disgust response and having it be a little bit long lasting helps avoid objects that are covered in germs, but also the germs that hang around even after that object is gone. Now, our ancestors didn't have any kind of germ theory. They didn't know that germs cause disease, but it's adaptive for us to avoid both objects that are obviously visually contaminated like a rotting carcass, but also anything that that rotting carcass has touched. It's adaptive for us to avoid eating after our hands have touched a rotting carcass because there are germs on our hands. So our ancestors didn't know that, but the ones that had a long lasting pervasive disgust response that inhibited them for eating, that inhibited them from eating for a long time after they encountered something disgusting may have been less likely to make themselves sick by touching something contaminated and then touching food and eating it. So disgust and fear have different adaptive values. And so it, it might just be adaptive for disgust to be resistant to habituation. There also could be less safety learning from disgust exposures. So one thing that we learn when we encounter um, a phobic object is that it's actually not as dangerous as we thought. But maybe it is just as disgusting as we thought. Like throwing up, for example, people with emetophobia get terrified when they think they might throw up. And there's really nothing dangerous about throwing up most of the time. In fact, most of the time it's necessary and good for you. But just because it's not dangerous doesn't mean it's not really disgusting. So the danger is disproven when you encounter vomit or when you encounter vomiting yourself, but the disgust isn't disproven. You are totally right that it's gonna be disgusting. So there might be less safety learning with disgust exposures. It's also possible that with safety learning, um, we learn that we can tolerate our anxiety response, but maybe disgust responses are less tolerable than fear responses, and that's related to habituation. Fear peaks and then goes down pretty quickly, but disgust lingers. So with safety learning, we're learning that we can tolerate our fear response, and if we wait it out long enough, which isn't usually very long, it'll go away. We might be learning the opposite with disgust. We might be learning that if we trigger disgust, we're going to feel gross for a really long time. So there could be less safety learning. Okay. So another aspect of phobias that activate the parasympathetic nervous system is that in some cases, they can cause what's known as vas vasovagal syncope. Let me try that again. They can activate what's known as vagovasal syncope, which is um, a, a phenomenon that's produced when we experience sudden drops in blood pressure. And essentially, it causes just fainting and passing out. So in some cases with blood injection injury phobias, patients will actually pass out at the sight of blood. And this is um, an example of a, a person with a blood injection injury phobia who filmed, him, filmed himself getting blood taken and having a vasovagal, vasovagal syncope. If you move your hand, the vent, you move the hand. I know, I don't want to, I can't, I can't yes. listen to it. You Can you do to, it from here? I will, but you have to keep your hand. So when you're feeling faint, when your blood pressure is really low, it's safer to be in a reclining position um, and it makes it less likely that you'll pass out because you want your head to not be higher than your heart. So actually knowing that this guy faints during blood draws, they should have taken his blood while he was lying down. That would make it less likely that he'd pass out because it makes it easier for your heart to get blood to your brain, even when it's not, uh, even when your blood pressure is lower. That's great. If you're moving your hand, that's a needle. It's I know, I can't, but I'm gonna pass up. That's 
find this for the first time. I need to take a break. I need juice. I need juice. I need juice or something. I'm not sure. Okay, so in addition to having him lie down to make it harder to faint, um, when they realized he was going to faint, they should have had him practice applied tension. And what applied tension is, is intentionally using muscle activity to redirect or to raise your blood pressure. So when you feel like you're going to faint in a situation where you might experience vasovagal syncope, which is usually, as I said, caused by blood injection injury phobia, but it can be, dis it can be caused if you have a strong enough disgust response because disgust drops your blood pressure. So if you feel like you're going to pass out, what you should do is tense your limbs. So make your, all of your muscles, especially your hands and feet, as tense as possible. And what that's actually doing is squeezing the blood from your extremities into your core. So it's making more blood available. Um, it's squeezing your blood vessels, constricting your blood vessels, which raises your blood pressure and makes more blood available to your brain. So it makes it less likely that you'll faint. So when people have blood injection injury phobia, often one of their biggest fears is of the experience of feeling faint and passing out because it's a pretty gross feeling. So in addition to doing exposure for those people, you also often need to teach them to practice applied tension. So you need to teach them to control their fainting response. So why do people um why do people faint at the sight of blood so it's probably adaptive it's probably an evolutionarily conserved response if we have an if we had ancestors who were prone to fainting when they saw blood well one of the situations where you tend to see blood especially as an ancestral hunter gatherer is when it's your own blood and you're bleeding so dropping your blood pressure and lying prone on the ground because you're unconscious both of those things will slow bleeding, make it less likely that you'll bleed out. So vasal vagal, vasal vagal syncope caused by seeing blood is adaptive, but it's not adaptive in our modern environment. And it's a physiological overreaction to a situation like getting blood drawn where you're not in any danger of bleeding out. Okay, so as I said, um, phobias are really common and even though, so even though phobias are common, um, most people have like an object or a situation that they do fear to some extent that makes them feel either really anxious or really uncomfortable, really grossed out, even if it doesn't rise to the level of a phobia. Um, so you don't have to do this experiment. You can skip ahead by about 60 seconds if you don't want to see this. But this is an example of what a disgust mediated phobia feels like. So this isn't a real phobia in the sense that what I'm about to show you, most people think it's gross and most people have a parasympathetic and anxiety response to it. But it's, I've never seen a patient who actually had impairment caused by avoidance of this thing or who experienced such acute distress when seeing it that it got in the way of their life. So this is the case of trypophobia. And if you follow this link in the slide set, it will take you to a BuzzFeed article that has lots of pictures of trypophobia triggers. So trip, bleh, trypophobia is the intense distress and discomfort that for some people is caused by clusters of tiny holes. So this is a really common thing for people not to like. And we probably have an evolutionarily conserved reason for not liking this. We're probably prepared to find this disgusting. Um, because in our evolutionary environment, if someone with a face covered in sores came up to us, it would be adaptive for us to be grossed out by that and to want to stay away because clusters of tiny holes may be a symptom of a contagious skin condition. It could also be um, something like poisonous or dangerous, like an insect, like a spider or a fly, or it could be um, a, sorry, I'm like, oh, sorry. It could be something poisonous or dangerous, like a spider or a fly, or it could be something like um, animal eggs, like poisonous spider eggs. So in our, evolution, in our environment of evolutionary adaptation, it was probably adaptive for us to be grossed out by this and to not like seeing it. However, um, many people have trypophobia to the degree that if you click on that link and look at some of those images, 
eventually you'll really have a strong impulse to avoid, to close out of that window and to stop looking at it, which is fine because it's not gonna get in the way of you living your life. We don't encounter clusters of tiny holes very often unless we seek them out online. But because it's pretty universally seen as disgusting but not to the level of a phobia, it actually makes a really good self-experiment to see what exposure might be like for yourself. So if you wanna do this, you can post about it on the discussion board. Um, just share what your experience was like. But if you follow the link to the BuzzFeed article, there's gonna be lots and lots of pictures. If you wanna do exposure, choose one at a time to look at. And before you start, rate how disgusted or anxious or upset it makes you on a one to 10 scale. So one would be, this is totally fine, this doesn't bother me. 10 would be, this is like one of the worst things I've ever seen and my impulse to avoid and escape is very strong. So then to do exposure, don't avoid, make sure that you're engaging with it, look at it. Don't let yourself look away. Don't let yourself like narrow your eyes or squint. S just stay with the image, keep interacting with it, keep looking at it, keep exploring it with your eyes until you notice that yourself starting to habituate, until you notice your number. So the, the numerical score you gave to your anxiety or disgust, until you notice it's starting to go down. So even though I just talked about why disgust doesn't habituate, usually when it's a phobic context, we experience both disgust and fear. So you'll probably experience a little bit of both to these images and pay special attention to your fear decreasing. But as I said, I'm interested to hear your experiences. So if you notice any difference in how your disgust and fear decrease to these images, post about it on the discussion board. So on the next slide, I'm going to demonstrate what it looks like to not avoid and to engage with an image as you're doing this self-exposure just um, with the image we just looked at. So if you don't wanna see that image bigger, um, again, skip ahead by 30 or 60 seconds. You don't have to do this self-exposure demonstration if you don't want to. It's only for those of you who are curious what it's like. Okay, so I would say that my fear and disgust rating, and it's mostly disgust, for this image is the first time I found it, it was like a five. Um, but because I've been making these slides and going over them, I've actually done this exposure a good number of times. So at this point, I would say it's like a two, maybe even a one. But if I were to go back to where I was when I first saw this image, I would say that my attention is drawn to this area here. So like the tightest cluster of dots. And I'm also bothered by the contour. So the fact that it kind of looks like a super close up of a pimple, but like if a pimple was your whole face, because these would be the pores. So what I'm doing right there is focusing on aspects of it that increase my disgust and anxiety. But I could also focus on aspects of it that send safety signals that don't increase my disgust and anxiety. So yeah, I mean, clusters of tiny holes sometimes are spider eyes or skin diseases or millions of blackheads. But, you know, sometimes they're also the center of a flower and flowers are pretty. I'm not disgusted or scared of flowers. So I can think about ways that this image is gross, but I can also think about ways that this image is pretty neutral or safe. It might be a spider, but more likely than that, it's actually a flower. So I can also look at features of it that are neutral, that don't raise my disgust and anxiety. There's nothing that I find particularly disgusting about the colors. So I can sort of think about the colors as I'm taking in this image. Um, so there's some pink, there's some brown, there's some yellow. So again, yellow is kind of a gross color. It maybe makes me think of like pus and skin disease. Pink could too, it could be like irritation. And then again, like the, the black could be blackheads. So it's important while you're doing an exposure to not engage in cognitive avoidance, to not do things that in your head that make your anxiety go down. You want your anxiety to go down naturally. So when I think about more neutral interpretations of this picture, I also do want to engage mentally with some of the less neutral interpretations of this picture. I'm trying to have a more accurate experience of this picture. I'm not trying to mitigate my disgust, but I'm also allowing myself to see signs that are not as disgusting. So when I did this exposure for myself the first time, I actually did practice this. And I, like I said, my number was probably a five. And I would say that it, it only took about a minute of solidly looking at it and not avoiding for it to go down to about a one or a two. So that's kind of the end for today. Um, these are just some takeaways to think about as you're studying the slide or studying the slide set. 
Um, and again, if you decided to do the trypophobia self-exposure, I'm interested to hear your experiences on the discussion board. There's also other discussion topics at the end and then some further readings. So um, first person perspective of going through exposure for blood injection injury phobia, some articles about controllable stress and child separation at the border, and then a really interesting article about the evolution of disgust. So that is the end for today. Thanks for hanging out through that somewhat long lecture. And I will look forward to seeing you guys on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. All right.